and we welcome you to the show, uh, Dr. Tech Show, where myself, Pauline Roach and Swain Hunter, an occasional guest, guide you through the world of online communications in a show which was the brainchild of the late great internet evangelist, John Popham. And in traditional fashion, we ask our guest and our my co-presenter, Swain, how the weather is where you are. So, Swain, let's start with you this week. How is the weather where you are? How has it been in the last week? I'm in Orkney and we've had mixed weather over the past week, but today it's absolutely wonderful. It's a lovely spring day. It's very late that everything's coming up this year. All the seeds and things are very late, but today hopefully we'll get a good boost. Excellent. And our guest today is Ro Hans. Uh, Ro, where are you and how has the weather been where you are this week? Good morning, both. Um, I'm in sunny Wolverhampton. We have had some lovely weather earlier in the week, but of course we've got the truly traditional bank holiday rain now. And similarly here in the west of Ireland, uh, it is raining today, has been lashing rain this morning. It's not right now, luckily enough, and so maybe I'll get a walk uh, by the sea later on. But uh, we've had a beautiful weekend. It's been glorious weather. And I've been in the sea. I've been sunbathing. I can't I can't complain at all. It's been a real, a real joy. Um, so we have a few things that we're mar- marking around this time of year before we get on to hear our special guest, Ro. Um, so Monday, the 3rd of May, uh, was the when Britain's first and only general strike began at one minute before midnight on the 3rd of May, 1926, and it lasted just 10 days. And the strike was called by the Trades Union Congress, TUC, in support of coal miners who'd been told that their wages were to be reduced by 13% and the length of their shifts increased from seven to eight hours. So in response, miners in the north of England, Scotland and Wales went on strike marching to the slogan, not a minute on the day, not a penny off the pay. And in London, a trigger event for the general strike came when printers of the Daily Mail in Fleet Street refused to print a leading article criticising trade unions. And shortly afterwards, the TUC called out all of its members in essential industries. The result was that an estimated 1.75 million people across the country stopped work. They include dockers, printers, power station workers, railway men and transport staff. And the TUC's aim was to bring the capital to a halt and so force the government to act on behalf of the miners. And uh, we know there's more that happened after that. Um, But uh, and legislation happened that uh, stopped people from joining a general strike and so on. So striking um, is always a difficult thing to do, but, you know, essential when when workers need to uh, uh, kind of stick up for their rights. I've, I know I've been on strikes myself before and refused to cross picket lines and stuff. So, you know, power to the workers. Um, I think we can all think that that's a legitimate uh, uh, thing to, to do. So moving on, um, May is National Share a Story Month. And this is one that uh, Swain picked up uh, from the fcbg.org.uk website. Um, this is an annual celebration of the power of storytelling and story sharing providing a fantastic opportunity to fulfill the core aim of the FC, FCBG of bringing children and stories together across the country. Federation book groups and individuals run a whole host of events. And each year they're inspired by a specific theme and work with different organizations to provide people with resources and opportunities. And the theme of this year's uh, National Share Story Month has the theme of myths, magic and mayhem. And I think um, we really like this one because uh, libraries obviously do a lot of uh, this sort of thing, which we're, we're, we're very keen on libraries on this show. Um, and our uh, founder, uh, John Popham, was a great storyteller and a great believer in the power of storytelling. So um, I think he would have been very keen to see us promote this one. Um, how, are we, how are we on stories? Swain, are you a good storyteller? No, I'm not a good storyteller. Stories are meant to have a beginning, a middle and the end. And I, I tend to get mixed up about, <laughs> about that. And Rob, what about you? Do you like telling stories? Uh, I'm, I'm very much in the camp of Swade. <laughs> I like to think I am, but uh, yeah, things get a little jumbled, unfortunately. Yeah. But I like to listen to stories. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I have um, several nieces and nephews, and um, I have been known to um, uh, call them up on Zoom and, and read a story to them. Um, I think that's one of the, the one I did. The one I've done this year uh, has been recorded, so um, I'm sure my nephews will be going back to it at some stage um but i I did learn a lesson actually on storytelling and that is to read the story yourself before you read it to your nieces and nephews because things might happen that you're not expecting and you might think "Mm, maybe that wasn't the best story to (laughs) yes to to have read to them story yes (laughs) (laughs) 
Okay, moving on to uh, events that are happening that we would like to promote. Um, one that we spotted this morning from our friend uh, Ross McCullough of Third Sector Lab in Scotland is one called Digital Potential. And this is actually a Welsh programme, a hands-on programme to empower charities and social entrepreneurs to put users first and get the most out of digital. And the invitation is to collaborate with others in the sector, learn from leading practitioners and come away with clarity and confidence in taking your digital projects forward. And it's going to be six hours a week for six weeks, starting on Monday, the 17th of May. I'm very, very impressed with your powers of translation, uh, Pauline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Swain's got the, the Welsh version. Uh, version on the screen. <laughs> I, have, I did study Welsh at one stage. <laughs> wow. We'll um, because I'm... Um, yeah, I, I like learning a, a bit about other languages. Uh, but yeah, this is um, in Welsh and English for those who, who would like to have either language to interpret it in. Um, so six hours a week for six weeks, starting the 17th of May. And it's for senior leaders in social enterprises and charities in Wales. And it's going to be delivered online through a mixture of workshops and coaching. And the cost is fully subsidised by the uh, uh, Wales, Wales Council for Voluntary Action and the Welsh Government. Um so that was one, as I say, promoted by our uh, friend uh, Ross McCullough in Scotland uh, from Third Sector Lab. Um, and it sounds like it, it'll be a really good one. Ross uh, is also offering, the Third Sector Lab is also offering um, the next iteration of their program, The Curve, which is a ho- another load of um, digital learning opportunities for people in charities and voluntary organizations. And so if you look on the thirdsectorlab.co.uk website, you'll see that as well. And that's available for, um, I think, charities throughout the UK um, and well worth it. Well worth a look. Ross has been doing brilliant work um, since lockdown and before um, on getting charities upskilled around digital. So he's a great person to know about and follow. Um, yeah, have, have either of you been upskilling yourselves in any way around digital since lockdown, Swain? Oh my, I mean, I suppose getting to grips with how to do this show has been one thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, all sorts of bits and pieces. Um, typically to do with um, event, online events. I, I think I've, I think I've, I've not done anything formal training, but um, done lots of investigations and, and sort of learning by doing. Yeah, yeah, same here. And Ro, what about you? Are you learning? You did new your things? computer course, Pauline. I did. Yeah, I'll come back to that in a minute. Ro, how are you? How's your learning been? Well, I mean, we work in the world of digital, but it doesn't mean that I'm a particularly good practitioner. So I think for me, I've got every ambition and had every ambition, but the day-to-day of work has gotten in the way. But I think one thing I have mastered is the art of collaborative video technologies, <laughs> finally, like we all have, I think, during lockdown. Mm, yeah, certainly. Yeah, what Swain was referring to was a course I did at uh, Furcroft College in Birmingham uh, on a level two IT uh, in social media uh, uh, a class I did with seven or eight uh, other students. And um, I think it, it uh, kind of, I decided I wanted to do something to get a, an actual qualification in, in IT because like so many of us, I'm self-taught around IT uh, a lot of the time. And um, I wanted to be in a classroom environment and it was very nice. The first couple of weeks of the course, I was actually able to be in the college on one of the days. Um, and it's a wonderful institution. It's a college of um further education it, anyway there's, there's a lot of courses um especially for underrepresented people in birmingham and uh, a lot of people go on it and they do a lot of re- residential uh, courses as well when 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 they can um and they serve you your meals at lunchtime so it's a you know great real bonus it's very social and uh, and a good learning environment as well so thanks that, to was, that was back in the kind of summer and autumn when things it was to be yeah wasn't it? yeah mm-hmm. so let's hope things improve more permanently this let's year let's hope we can do that again soon mm-hmm. yep Yep. Okay, so um, one more event that we're marking uh, around this time. Uh, Dementia UK is running a a, a campaign, I think it's called Time for a Cuppa. And this May, they're inviting people to have a cake and cuppa with friends and family to fundraise for Dementia UK and help even more families receive the life-changing emotional support and practical support of dementia specialist Admiral Nurses. Um, they're saying that now more than ever, they, they need our help. And the pandemic obviously has, has hit families facing dementia very hard. And Admiral nurses have been supporting families through some of the most challenging days they've seen with support groups and centres closed, often looking after a person with dementia on their own 24 hours a day. And obviously things may look a bit different this year, but making time for a cuppa has never been so important. Whether it's tea at the table from a few metres away or a promise to meet up in the future, they're inviting people to let the people you care about know you want to have a cuppa with them. All the while, raising funds for life-changing Admiral nurses 
to help families face dementia. So uh, a good one to support and one we hope other people will, will join in on. And so we move on to our uh, very special guest for today, who is Ro Hans, who I only met last week, twice actually, the one day, which was a real uh, uh, treat. Uh, Ro is MD and Le Legal Counsel for the Learn Play Foundation and also rep is here representing Wolves Tech Aid, which is an, a new project. Um, Learn Play was an, is a not-for-profit company which set up in 2007. And Ro started her career at the Daily Mail and General Trust and then went to Bound Global Solution before retraining as a corporate and IP lawyer. Um, and the organization that she uh, works for now started as a means, Learn Play, sorry, started as a means to engage the disaffected marginalized and underserved by using creative digital media as a way to augment and transfer skills and occur, uh, encourage economic activity. It has a strong civic mandate and has created a training division alongside a digital studio built by the talent that has been upskilled. Um, and they've now uh, helped to set up Wolves Tech Aid with MP Pat McFadden to help bridge the digital inequalities which were further highlighted during the pandemic. Uh, with school children not able to ac access devices or connectivity to undertake remote learning. And now that schools have reopened, children have missed a full year of education and catch-up is even more vital outside of school. And the um, purpose and focus of World Tech Aid is to identify and repurpose a wide variety of technology to eliminate the inequality of access to digital education within the home for families across the city. Um, so they worked, as, as they said, with, alongside the MP Pat McFadden to develop this initiative, and they're going to be helping to run it over this coming year. So, Ro, you're very welcome to the show. Thanks very much for joining us today. Um, and uh, can we start with uh, a bit more about World's Tech Aid, and then we'll go back into kind of how you got involved in technology in the first place. So please tell us a bit about World's Tech Aid. Well, I think you've done a, a brilliant job just sort of encapsulating you know, the, the main thrust of, um, of the initiative. But um, we've known Pat for a little bit of time now at Learn Play. We're, we're based in his constituency. So we've kept a little bit of um, correspondence going on through lockdown. I think like most cities, we were starting to see the negative impact. Um, what was very clear was that schools had very different ways of distributing education through the pandemic. So some had really gotten their act together and they had great... Um, Zoom classes, so it was just like being at school, but obviously virtual. Um, some were more guiding, dropping links, um, and some were just checking in maybe once every couple of days. Either way, all of them fundamentally needed technologies as a way of accessing things. So I think it's the same story across the country where we sort of realised that um, there are quite high figures, especially in underserved communities um, around digital inequality. So we had lots of stories that perhaps where there was one family member that had a smartphone that might have been two or three years old. Naturally, if you've got multi-siblings in a household, let alone one, accessing devices to be able to uh, get involved with learning was just pretty much impossible. So um, Pat got in touch with us as a digital company, as a not-for-profit and said, you know, how can we do something about this? I think um, what we were very aware of, that there were a number of initiatives that were starting to take, um, to gather some momentum across the country. So what we did was we got in touch with a few of them and just did a little bit of best practice sharing. Lambeth Online was one that had gotten a little bit of, um, uh, uh, it, you know, it, it'd been in the press a little bit and, mm. and the people there were fantastic. So we spoke with them. We asked them how they did it, you know, what the, what the impact was. We were also aware that in our city as well, um, there are a couple of initiatives that look to get devices out, which were great. So again, we didn't want to come in and just sort of tread all over those. We just wanted to work complementarily with them. What was interesting through the digital coalition group that we both attend, Pauline, was that a lot of people sort of saying that lending schemes, whilst very noble, perhaps had a few, um, issues that we were starting to become aware of. I think mainly that families were very afraid of damaging machines that were lent to them. Mm. So what often happened was they, they just parked them on a shelf out of the way just to protect them. So clearly sort of counterintuitive to what, what the schemes were trying to do. When we started working with Pat, you know, having taken a lot of advice across the country, 
we felt that this had to be a legacy scheme so that people felt they could really, you know, get under the skin of the technology, utilize mm. the machine. The main focus is really for school children to be able to, you know, at the time go online to receive lessons. But outside of that, with the roadmap to reopening in schools being one of the first to go back, we knew um, that it's incredibly important because most schools had suffered some sort of, I guess, haphazard delivery over the 12 months. So mm. the way that they clustered, if one person in the cluster tested positive, everybody was back home. So it was very fractured, the learning. Yeah. So we knew that there would be a lot of catch up <clears throat> outside of learning uh, outside of traditional school and during the holidays. So really, we just tried to look at the scheme end to end. How do we get the machines? Or let's ask people to donate them. We need to be very clear on what they could donate. Mm -hmm. Then we needed to look at the next step in the chain, which was to work with a fantastic, like-minded community interest group to get them refurbished. Mm -hmm. They do that at a very nominal cost. I mean, 50 pounds feels nominal to a business, but perhaps not to, to, to every day, hence mm. the fundraising element as well. So mm -hmm. they turn around the machines, they get them boxed ready with all of the peripherals, ready to go to a school who then distributes them to the school. So, you know, the tech aid thing is really asking for two things. Give us old machines, no matter what state, we just ask, please no broken screens. We can't do much with that. Even if they're terribly old, it's okay. We can do that lovely word that I love saying, we can Frankenstein them. <laughs> you know, take bits and pieces out of them and we can yeah. build new machines. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so far, We've not put a lot of marketing effort into it because a lot of the councils are in Perda. Um, so once, you know, Perda finishes, we know that we've got the might of the council behind us so they can reach out to communities, they can reach out to businesses. Pat McFadden and myself have written to a lot of businesses. So, so far, we've raised just short of three and a half thousand pounds. We've got about 50 plus devices that have either been booked in or ready to collect. Um, a really great thing happened, which I think is really going to help, you know, really push this through. The football club got involved. So Yay. those of you that know Wolverhampton. Hey, Wanderers. <laughs> yeah. So it really uh, is Wolves, as in Wolverhampton Wanderers. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Oh, wow. Absolutely, Swen. So they're in the, um, uh, they're in the top, you know, top division, top mm. league, premiership. So we've been um, working with the foundation who are obviously very community minded. So they've been absolutely fantastic. They are giving us, videos from the players from uh, first team players which you know they've got three million people on their social media yeah, you can't buy that sort of no, you, you absolutely own. can't i mean yes quite a lot of them are in mexico but still um you know they're, they're, there's a, a, a good old um you know there's a good spread across the uk so we're getting mm. first team player videos which will really help mm. they'll push it on their socials and the great thing is come august once the player schedules sort of lighten up and they you know, gone through their, their holiday period and their friendlies, we'll actually get some first team players, we hope, being able to be part of the actual handing over of kit. Fantastic. Um, so every time we get some kit ready, we sort of go in collectives of 10 to 20. So Pat and some of the learn play team and the school teachers and the children, we go to schools, we do the big handover to try and generate some press and some PR, but mm. nothing's going to get some attention like a footballer yeah. yeah absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. You know, we're really looking forward to that but in a nutshell that's really you know the main focus of the scheme oh, i can see great. yeah i can see all kinds of uh spin-offs or kind of connections here including uh the women's football team because obviously um you know we all want to encourage more women in tech because there's a there's a there's a dearth um so if you can get some of the women's football t footballers involved as well i think that would be that would be really fantastic do you know what Pauline? that's such a brilliant idea we hadn't you know we hadn't sort of spread our thinking that far but i think that's a great idea and no, we'll definitely do that thank you great no i'm, I'm delighted i love wolverhampton uh, i've i lived there for a while um uh, before I got married, my husband had a, my husband now husband had a uh, had lived there with his uh, first wife who sadly died. But they, um, yeah, it was it was a wonderful city, very uh, friendly and um, welcoming city uh, to me when I when I was there for a while. So yeah, I re I re I'm very fond of Wolverhampton. No, and I'm getting so. I mean, I'm not you know from the, from the Midlands, but we've been based in Wolverhampton now for four or five years, and I think that. 
it's really interesting, you know, the way people perceive some of the black country um, boroughs. So, mm. you know, being a southerner, um, I thought of Wolverhampton as being quite industrious. We mm-hmm. know why the black country is called the black country. But when myself and my husband came here, we were really, I mean, we were just sort of taken aback that the amount of sort of um, trust stuff that goes on, we've got, um, we, we, we border onto so much beautiful countryside. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot to offer as a city. So I echo every, all the yep. sentiments. Yeah, very, very fine. Actually, very fond of the black country uh, as on a wider uh, perspective as well. I and I heard great things like, uh, around uh, online communications for, for places like the Black Country Museum. Apparently, their TikTok is just amazing. Um, and again, maybe that's somebody we can get on the show at some stage. Um, so yeah, Wolverhampton is a, a, I think has has a great has great potential and has a really um, strong um, uh, Council of Voluntary Action and. Um, also the council, I know Heather Clark, who comes to those coalition meetings that we, we both attend now, um, has also done a lot of work in the community for many years. And Absolutely. yeah, it's a very active uh, community there. So shout Absolutely. out for the community. community yes, in, definitely. In and, and what a forward thinking council. And I think with people like Heather, who are sort of leading the digital initiative, that's really how we, we got, um, you know, onto the coalition Pauline and, and a little bit more connected with the city. Mm. So, you know, we're very grateful for for, 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 for very forward thinking people like that. Yeah. Yeah. So Ro, um, we, we always like to hear from our guests about how they, their digital background, if you like. So kind of, uh, were you involved in digital from a young age? Were you building websites a, as a kid or is this kind of a later, a later in life uh, arrival for you? This is where I feel like a little bit of an imposter. So um, I've always been a um, on the sidelines of all things digital. So growing up with a very, very uh, digital brother, marrying a very digital person and being involved with a digital company. So I've always pushed digital, but not been um, particularly conversant with the tools myself, but completely mm. appreciate and understand the huge importance of digital future skills and trying to skill up. So... Um, I don't do so much with digital. I just sort of push it and try and Mm -hmm. get it up on people's agenda. But what we have got are just some fantastic people within our business and within the family that kind of put me straight. Unfortunately, I'm the person that has to ask my husband for tech support. He's got a T-shirt that says I am not tech support. (laughs) that he likes to put on but um you know I as a special that. lockdown t-shirt is it <laughs> I, think so. I think so very much, um, very much so but um I do understand the importance of it. I'm just not particularly conversant with it mm, mm. well I think um you know as as we have kind of a, uh, d- done so many shows and kind of learn we're learning on the, on the hoof as well some some of the time and uh, we've become more uh kind of aware of a bigger picture really when we, when we talk about digital inclusion and people are digitally included or excluded now we uh, between us think we've we've come to the realization that um just because someone doesn't have a device or data or the connection um doesn't mean that they are necessarily digitally excluded because if they know somebody who has the the means to connect and they're happy to ask that person to help them then then that 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 they're on the spectrum of digital inclusion so Absolutely. and similarly with yourself um as an advocate of uh, digital inclusion and helping um other people to get the devices and the data that they need um i think it's it's a bigger it's a bigger world than than just the technical uh, element of things Absolutely. the technology is actually such in some ways such a small part of everything that needs to be done I mean, all the all the all the um, description you gave there about how your organisation has kind of put together this project. I mean, the actual technology at the centre of it is not very complicated. It's yeah. not difficult for you know it can be quickly learned. The difficult part is reaching the people who might need to use the service. Yeah, finding the partners who can actually help you fund it understanding and you 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 put you, you put this very really well that, that that there is no matter you know no matter if you have a big pile of equipment donated you still need some cash mm-hmm. to actually pay for some stuff yeah. and all that stuff understanding and organizing all of that stuff is far more difficult than actually doing the technical tasks that need to yeah, be, I, also need I, to be mm-hmm. done and you know mm-hmm. i don't want to dim, downplay that too much yeah. but uh i, I think I, I've, I, I work in IT, I have done for 30 years, and I mean, I therefore have to try to pretend that I understand more of the technology than, than maybe I actually do. 
um, because we all work in very specific little niche areas in our day jobs. And uh, the whole the whole point of the digital thing to me is that it's complicated. It it depends very much on what individual people or communities are actually trying to get done. Yeah. And depending on where they are starting, how much they've got to grips with it previously, it's as Pauline used the, the spectrum word that we like, um, you know, there's a whole, it's not a question of, you know, we've got this pile of people here who are digitally excluded, we will do this to them and now they're included. It doesn't really work like that. It's mm. a kind of ongoing process and uh, it takes many different uh attitudes many different skills many different um practices a few professionals here and there of various types and i don't mean technical ones necessarily uh, to actually help people get done what they want to do and natter with who they want to natter with as john I mean, would have said <laughs> when you're, you're absolutely right i mean one of the, the other big focuses of our company is that we've really spent a lot of time working with those young people I guess a, we do cradle to the grave but it's really 16 to 30 year olds that have found themselves to be um, you know maybe second or third generation endemic worklessness they um, are not economically active they are not on a trajectory for higher education not going to go into a lot of the profession mm. so what we found was that digital technology was the great carrot in which to pique their interest. Um, most people under the age of 40 are sort of, I always use this analogy, sort of born like this, being able to hold a PlayStation controller, and they're very, very <laughs> conversant with that technology. So, I'm over 40, but I've learned. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. But I think our whole kind of vision, which really stemmed a lot from, um, you know, the other partners at, at Learn Play, my husband included, was really that if we could, encourage or get people into assessing and we could use games as the kind of hook because we know that those people that play games not all of them but the ones that we were trying to aim at they weren't doing well at school they were excluded they weren't going to school they weren't really getting a formal education and they weren't enjoying the way that education was distributed to them so we knew that you know a lot of these young people that if we could get them in by the hook of games and we could get them talking about games and suddenly they were exceptionally articulate where they didn't want to yes. stand up in class and talk That's about right. something. If you said to them, why shouldn't a nine-year-old play Grand Theft Auto? They could be very, very articulate. They mm -hmm. could present, yep. they could get the, you know, they could put together um, thought and structure to their presentation, to their mm -hmm. argument, mm -hmm. all of these sets of skills. And then a lot of these people also modded games you know, they've got, oh, wow. they mm. created sort of modifications to games yes, to be a bit more engaging in the communities that they played with. So again, those skills were real life skills, STEM skills. And it's really about saying, how do we get you to harness those skills yeah. that you already have? And let's just bring them across to other aspects of life. So we've always used creative digital media as a way to engage the hardest to reach in communities. Is creative and digital media a grown up way of saying games? Well, yeah, it is. But it, but it, it, we, we widened it a little bit. Um, so okay. so we used to just be games. And okay. we do a lot of soft skill development using games. So we bring out the pedagogy and those mm. sort of soft skills that were really important, like active listening, um, you know, communication, positive communication. But then we sort of broadened it to video production, to um, other design services. Digital Which, again, is a thing that many young people are, are just very, very good at. Well, they because they make their TikToks. Yeah. They do. Mm. I mean, it's not it's not All safe to say that everyone under the age of twenty five is really busy at games and no. uh, and right. and video editing. But there's a whole swathe of people there who whose focus is on that. So Absolutely. since that's where they are, that's yeah. where we kind of need to start. You know, lots lots of you know young people now. Um, they're very conversant with media and they don't actually realize the, the skills they've got. So if they're editing a video for Instagram, for TikTok, you know, they're doing all of the, you know, the basic skill set. It's just not formalized. But mm. the ability now to have a range of different careers as a result of things, you know, when I when I was growing up, you know, it was very, you know, you knew what the trajectory was. Um, I was growing up as tech was just really coming in. But I still had to go to the library and figure out all the decimal, do we, you know, all of the different yeah. um, 
system to try and navigate myself to a book. I mean, nowadays it's so very different, but what we what comes with it really is being able to try and encourage young people to understand how to discern information, yeah. check its veracity. Yes. Because it's back in the day, the old adage was, oh, if it's in the newspaper, it must be true. Now it's if it's on, you know, on Wikipedia or if it's on on digital, it must be true, but it's understanding really both of those probably need some examination but anyway <laughs> well, i said i said to my mother if it's on facebook it must not be true yes, absolutely <laughs> yeah, absolutely. yeah. Well, and, and you're right that the number of sources of information is just incredible now yeah. mm. and they're not all reliable by any means no and, and we do try and encourage people to use reliable sources coming back to our public libraries um uh uh, kind of span or kind of encouragement for the for, for this week um we, we like the you know libraries because they they teach people how to be selective how to be how to interpret uh information correctly how to you know decide whether whether information is true or not um which is so important for all of us but i really like your um you're talking about gamifying uh, things because i think that's got a lot of potential for um, business and for uh, voluntary organisations as well that we haven't really explored yet. Uh, we had a guest on a couple of weeks ago, Ben Haddock from Sandwell Fab Lab um, about AI. And um, I think, you know, those those kind of areas are un- under underexplored for, for the communities that we're working with as yet. But I think there is great potential. And I think John Popham, had he stayed with us, um, been able, had he been able to, um, would have probably been progressing in, in that in that sphere as well. I mean, there, there really is, um, Pauline, we, we do a little bit. We, we sort of take what we call the functional skills, maths, English, IT, and we have gamified them. So they are mm. like brain trainer games. Mm. We're working with, we're, you know, hopefully getting involved with, with, with a college um, to look at distributing that as a way for people to be able to learn outside yeah. of learning. You know, so what we find with a lot of, um, lot of lessons is that there is that time gap where the next lesson has to recap a lot from before to mm. reinforce the learning. So we're looking at ways that people can just pick up their phone and engage with short, sharp learning bursts like they do with brain training games. Mm. The other thing is that we've got a lot of colleagues, um, and again, I've, I've referenced my husband quite a lot. He works with quite cutting edge technology around AR and VR. Mm. So, I mean, I can't speak on his behalf, but they're involved with a number of big projects, a number of universities and teaching hospitals where they're using those technologies as a way to assist patients going into big um, hospitals. So they've got a Pathfinder project. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can go into a hospital now and they're like a metropolis. Mm. Trying to navigate is pretty difficult. Um, During COVID times, trying to engage with a person to get instructions, but it's not just the visitors, it's also the staff, you know, trying to traverse these really huge builds Mm. and perhaps Mm. pre-prepare. When you're going to institutions, there are a lot of different moving parts for people. If you're restricted with mobility, if you have, uh, you know, you need to know where things are before mm. you start that journey. There are a number of people that need to pre-plan because of illnesses. So the kind of, you know, the, 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 the stuff that technology is able to do to really work um, empathetically with people in a very elegant, non-intrusive way, I think is absolutely um, fantastic mm. you know things mm. aren't necessarily led by technology they're just made better and enhanced and I think that coming right back to digital inequalities that's why it's really important that we help people be able to get on board but also reduce barriers to to interfacing with things my parents won't transact things um, online they're very scared to put anything online they're worried about being able to tell a spoof place from mm. a legitimate place. Yeah. Um, lockdown showed us that those that didn't have couldn't transact the things that government was saying, shop online, yes. do yes. this online, but they, mm. they, they weren't able to. So it's being able just to get those that have been left behind for a range of reasons, mm. you know, yeah. just being able to get onto that, that, yeah. that highway. Yeah, well, I'm hoping that um, with the work that we're involved in on, on the West Midlands Coalition for Digital Inclusion, you know, it will be an example and we can learn from others. As you have said, you've learned from Lambeth yeah. um, and we can learn from and teach others how to, you know, move people along the line because 
we don't want anybody to be left behind. And we're, but we're very aware that some groups uh, tend to get left behind more than others. Um, and so the underserved are the ones that we would um, want to want to hear more from. And I mean, um, going back to the kind of the origins of the Doctor Tech show was about storytelling, about how people are getting on, about how, how people are getting online for the first time, maybe some of them during COVID. That was really what, what started it, wasn't it? It was John mm. <clears throat> John's idea that um, there's all these people who are not online. Let's try and see if we can help some of them get online yeah. at least understand yeah. how to help them um get online so and that's why we we pester people like you to be our guests all the time yes yeah. you are an example of people of a range of different approaches which have, have really started to start to work and i wonder what you uh, lockdown the pandemic has been a terrible thing full stop do you feel that you might have made the progress you've made but for the lockdown, or is that a stupid question? I mean, would you have been trying to do the same things, or 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 would you? It's, it's, it's almost a it's almost a counterfactual history <laughs> question. But what do and you think? It's very it's very uncomfortable sometimes to answer this question. I mean, lockdown has been a terrible thing. Full stop. Absolutely, yeah. mm-hmm. we've had to, as all organisations, we've had to pivot. And what we've had to look at is, you know, so most of our deliveries face to face always has been, and <laughs> you know. We've had to look at how do we um, continue things. So we must have about 60 young people who are doing their maths, English and IT with us remotely. And the biggest problem they had was the will was there, didn't have the kit. So the first thing that we had to do was organize our team. So we're, we're 80 in our office, you know, there's 80 wow. of us. Mm. We had to organize a system of lending machines to people that are doing courses with us. So we did, you know, safe cleans, safe drop-offs. We got them data cards as well so they could continue their learning Mm -hmm. and then come back. So everything that we do in the office, so we do video production courses, game development courses, uh, design, all of those, as well as the English, maths and IT and apprenticeships. So we're a big apprenticeship provider. We moved it all to digital. And what we found was that our footprint could grow. So in the past, our footprint was really just the black country in Birmingham, people that could travel to us. Now we, we have no geographic limitations. Mm. But what we have got, you know, through a, an iterative organic process, we've got our patter down <laughs> and we've got that learning, you know, we've just made it immersive, we've made it fun, We've made it so that people can, and we've figured out the optimum learning time and downtime. So yes, that that has been a byproduct that no, we never foresaw, mm. but it's been something that we will take going forward. Yeah, yeah. We can do more that way. Yeah, mm. it's, it's, I, I say this nearly every week. Anybody who watches these regularly will get really bored of this next bit, but it'll be interesting to see how much of that stuff gets maintained and carried on into the future once we're all back doing things in person and how much of it kind of just falls by the wayside as either too Mm. complicated or difficult to do in some way or just not quite focused enough to actually get around to be really interesting to see how learning and teaching but also events whether they manage to keep some of this um inclusive remote stuff going that, that, that's been started up during the, the pandemic. Well, well our, I mean, sorry, I was just going to say, um, our vision is to do that. We know that there'll be a big sort of resurgence of people wanting to do a lot of face-to-face stuff. We also feel that looking at the patterning of what's going on around the world, um, you know, vaccines will have to always evolve. You know, there will always be different mutations. So we've already set out a store that we all, we will need to migrate seamlessly between yeah. different states of restrictions. Yeah we think possibly at least for the next 24, 36 months. Oh, yeah. we, one thing that will change for sure is that we won't be going, we won't be traveling to so many meetings mm. so frequently. Yes, the odd one, certainly inaugural ones and ones where it requires that little bit of collaboration. It's always done in a nice way, face to face. New people and the annual meeting kind of thing. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> we want to you know, encourage the green agenda. We want to reduce our carbon footprint. Yeah. There is no way that we'll be traveling you know, as frequently now. We'll have them via Zoom. The learning, we will always look at it as blended learning and we will always consult with people and say, you know, it's great to come in, but sometimes people have off days. What's interesting is sickness. We have found that people 
If they are sick, they will not come into work. If they are sick, they feel like they can work from home for a period of time and they can engage with things. So when learners used to come to us, if they felt a little bit under the weather with a cold, they wouldn't turn up. Mm. But they're happy to switch their computer on mm. and they're happy. So we will we will definitely keep a lot of that in our um, working practice going forward, for sure. What's going to be really interesting is to what extent people will attempt to do kind of hybrid like here we are in a meeting the three of us we're each in our we each have our own laptop and our own connection we're in a different we're each in a different room but we've got this space to interact in hurrah works so far so good anyway today mm -hmm. um, what'll be interesting i think is is trying to integrate into this sort of known kind of territory known now after the year we've just had trying to put in a little window in here, the room where two to 50 people are. Because it's one thing when there's when it's all one to one to one, but as soon as you start to have a room where there's more than one person, and maybe that's a more, uh, something like a more traditional training room, and if you're then trying to add people into that, I mean, schools have had this issue. The schools that have had to keep key worker education going, they've actually had to work twice. I've had to, I almost had to mm. do twice as many sessions as previously because if your school is closed apart from um, essential worker children then you've got then you have a group of children in a room that need taught but you've also got these hundreds of other kids distributed through the, the, the community that you have to interact with in, like this so how do you match up I think there's quite a bit of work to be done there in, a diff, in the different sectors to work out how to well, well first of all work out whether it's sensible to try to do these kind of hybrid things or whether we need to move forward into a situation where you either turn up in person and there's no remote uh, remote part and then the people who want to turn up remotely do it as a separate strand or or what well i mean uh, we're working with a lot of the colleges and we're, we're talking to them about how they want to do things and like us they've realized that they can do a lot um a lot differently and make us a lot of difference doing things remotely what we're finding from, from the kind of um, conversations we're having is that people are looking at both, perhaps not an either or, we're uh, being asked to deliver some stuff and it's taking in. Um, so, format. oh, there we go. Sorry, I missed that. Oh, uh, sorry. I, I, might have, uh, <laughs> I think it was my connection, maybe it was unstable. Uh, we're finding people are looking at both, you know, especially in academia, we're finding that they're looking yeah. at both and really sort of looking at... Um, being able to, 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 to offer both, but in some sort of structured way. Mm. Do you mean yeah. both as in two separate strands or blended together? As I kind of a room plus more 10 approaches around satellites. blending. That's yeah. what we're seeing. And the conversations we're having with people that do any sort of learning delivery, they're talking about blending mm -hmm. and that there will be still on site but they're talking about those being able to go into both depending yeah. on things. Yeah, no, it's, it'll just be really interesting how all that develops. I think my regular plug for the University of the Highlands and Islands, who've been doing this sort of thing for uh, a long, long time, 30 years or more, uh, using a variety of ancient technologies prior, which we're all trying to, in the end, trying to be Zoom. <laughs> mm, <yeah. laughs> or Teams or, or whatever, or Google Meet. Uh, but again, the, you know, it's just a question of how an organisation gets itself so that those things work for them. You can't just plonk the technology down and expect it all to work. Yeah, I was looking back through my um, my mother's notebook where she keeps all her passwords, as you can imagine. Um, uh, we were advised not to do, but I know we know people do it. Uh, oh, well, and... advice varies on that point. <laughs> we could get really bogged down in that. We could, we could. But anyway... Um, <laughs> I... Looking back through it uh, last week, and uh, I, I, when I put something on her iPad, I usually date, put a note in and date it so I can see it. And actually, I installed Zoom on my mother's iPad in 2019. So I was oh, ahead of the curve, yes, everybody. Sure. <laughs> sure. well, I'd never heard of Zoom before lockdown. Yeah, no, I had just briefly, but I knew it was enterprise, not, not yeah. community, but it quickly pivoted to community, yeah. definitely. Yeah. So I like I really like the idea of gaming and um, and kind of people learning, learning from games, because um, my, in, my own, in my own family, games are very popular, board games, especially we were playing a game, an Irish game. I don't I think it's an Irish game and it called 30 seconds yesterday where uh, with my sister and my nephew and my mom 
where you um, have to, it's like charades, but with voice. So you have, you get clues and you have to describe the, the word that's on the card to your partner in the game and they have to try and guess it. So it's, but it was really fun. And um, uh, yeah. That well, sounds brilliant. I mean, as long, as, go on. Sorry, I, I think we have a little bit of a lag, so I do apologise. No, no, just, just keep absolutely... butting in, we all do it. <laughs> yeah. no, we're doing fine. a project with the Heritage Lottery Fund, um, Pauline and Swain, which is about um, charting games over the last 50 years. So it includes traditional board games and collective games like bridge, um, darts, all the things that people come together from the different sort of um, cultural communities. So we're charting that alongside the development of video games from back in the Atari days to the e-sports that we see now. Ooh. Big million pound, like 14, three million pound um, mm. pots. And we're looking at both of them. And we're looking at people that, um, you know, uh, I'm just trying to think of other collaborative games and also in the different cultures. So in Indian mm. culture, there's one called Karam. Um, there are, uh, dominoes, and we're then getting people to try each other's out a little bit mm. of cross fertilization, mm. um, shared interest stuff. And um, that's a heritage lottery project that we're doing at the moment. So we'd love to talk to you about um, 30 seconds. Yeah, well, uh, it's it's a game. I don't know who runs here. If Swain had it on the screen there a minute ago. Oh, um, I've, I haven't the, seen the it in England. Is, so the website is the number 30, so 30seconds.ie, so it's mm. as Irish as you like. Right, yes. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. very, very interesting. Um, yeah, no, that sounds brilliant, um, Ro. I think I could see great potential there. I mean, it's great. Does it include, like, a field sports or, or like, ball and... No, it's... No. I mean, it does a little bit. I mean, but we're trying not to talk too much about the field sports, but it's really more those ones where communities gather together yeah. around a table. Mm -hmm. So it includes sort of early days Dungeons and Dragons. So we're talking to people that used to play that sort of early 80s who are now, uh, you know, uh, a little bit older and how that's still being played. And mm. we're talking about the kind of oral history that goes with with the gameplay, the shared stories, the communications yeah. and how really um, esports and video gaming how that is a version of the same, but just, mm. you know, um, played differently. Yeah, yeah. But then really trying to get um, those game players playing the more traditional games and vice versa, just to see what that looks like as that kind of, you know, cross fertilization. Yeah. Yeah, so looking at the last fifty years, really. Okay. Wow. Well, I, I mean, I, I, you know, you haven't mentioned chess, but I'm sure chess is one of the things you looked at as well. And my brother uh, was a was a kind of a, a very whiz in in chess, and he's been playing online now for for the last while uh, with people all around the world. And he he um, started playing with my nephew, and I started playing with my brother and my nephew as well. Um, so it's all that's all great stuff to be able to do. You know, it's like. The familiarity of a traditional game, but the convenience of having it on your phone and being able to play a move whenever you're on the bus or, you know, just just moving around the place. And the other, the other two things I've really enjoyed online in lockdown is a game called Wordscape and another one called uh, Duo, uh, uh, a learning a learning my, my own language, Irish, on Duolingo. And I, you know, I can spend an, a very uh, happy 15 minutes every night mm -hmm practicing my, my my vocabulary and and language and stuff and it's really it's a really nice thing to do and i've really appreciated the time to be able to put into that so yeah great i, I found your um b4 gaming project page so that's yes ah, interesting. okay it's just starting to be sort of put together so we're early days we're just doing a lot of interviews no. with people um so um yes we we certainly will be uh contacting you probably in about 30 seconds okay. that sounds brilliant yeah good Okay, doc. Um, I think we've got time, maybe Swain, for a few of the stories that we've picked up um, yes. in the last week, if you don't mind. I wonder if I can find them. <laughs> uh, the first one was from OpenDemocracy.net. Um, why uh, uh, the title was "Muted and Invisible: Why Justice Online Is Just Denied," and and this talks about the in the civil court system since COVID nineteen started, uh, the defendant disappears from view, rendered both invisible and inaudible. And apparently, I didn't know this, but since the early days of the pandemic, the large majority of hearings have taken place online unless lawyers have been able to persuade the judge of the need for an in-person hearing. Now, at an in-person hearing, the client is in the room and the judge watches their behavior and the client can speak to the judge directly or indirectly via their lawyer. But in an online hearing, by contrast, they're muted. Even their video is switched off by judges looking to save bandwidth, which sounds 
That's a real incredible. challenge. Mm. So, um, I mean, it's, it's COVID has accelerated the pressure for remote hearings. I think it was probably uh, there was some interest in it before. But um, in fact, it says online courts were first proposed in 2015 by one of the most senior civil judges, Lord Briggs. And his um, he did a report on it, which um, uh, reported that all civil cases, a recommendation was that all civil cases with a value of less than £25,000 would be allocated to an online and those um, low value cases proposed um, by Briggs would not need any sort of hearing at all, but could be decided perfectly by a judge on reading the papers. And those that remained could be decided at a telephone or electronic hearings, but um, uh, laws that affect the rich, high value commercial contracts and the other business of the high courts would all still take place in person as before. And the government accepted Briggs report in full and has committed billions of pounds to his scheme, apparently. Ministers in the senior judiciary continue to push for a transition to an online system. Uh, remote hearings, the master of the roles, the head of the civil division of the Court of Appeal insisted as recently as January uh, are an opportunity for UK, the UK to lead the world in pioneering a fully remote court system. Um, so it's going to be a money spinner for companies that possess very little knowledge of the courts. The co government says online courts would cost 1.2 billion. Some of these will be on criminal hearings, which have been swept into the planned online justice system alongside Briggs's original recommendations for civil hearings. Um, and the, the author of this piece, you know, says we all know online communication can be held, but in court, so much is at stake when words give way to cracks and fizzes of static, when judges discard bit by bit your own involvement in the hearing, your video, your audio, until you're left speaking into the void, hoping someone can hear. It seems that's, amazing that that's... you can spend billions of pounds on a system that judges have to switch bits off of to make them work. Very I mean, alarming. That just sounds un... I, I, I suppose we should probably say this is almost certainly England and Wales we're talking about here. More than likely. Uh, not, not Scotland or Northern Ireland, but I mean, be that as it may, it, it sounds like everything that a digital project shouldn't really be, which is just kind of plonking a whole lot of technology in a court and saying, get on with it. Yeah. Without having asking. a thought for how it's going to impact the actual event, the yeah. trial, the case, whatever. Absolutely. I'm not, I'm not asking for a legal opinion, Ro, but in your kind of personal opinion, what do you think of this? Do you know much about it? I mean, I've heard a lot about it through, through, through friends. I support the idea and the notion of being able to keep the legal system turning whilst mm. we're in, you know, the state that we've been in. But it can't be to the detriment of anyone. You know, habeas corpus is a really big thing. And if we're doing it digitally... Um, it has to work and it has to be um, secure and we can't have bandwidth being turned up. That surprises me. It, you know, in a big Zoom call where you've got 40, 50 plus people, you understand the need to turn cameras off to kind of, you know, um, retain bandwidth. But when you think about a smaller approach, when you've got perhaps a judge, a few of the personnel that are needed plus yeah, it, it surprises me, but it makes me realise that it's not ready for that. Mm, absolutely. And that it didn't happen. Can really, you, in, in, can in you briefly, many... sorry, uh, Ro, can you exp explain habeas corpus for people, people who may not oh, know, be familiar yeah. with the term? Um, please sorry. do not take this as a <laughs> definition, but I think, you know, you know, the... the, the this print... is not legal advice. No, this no. is not legal advice. <laughs> it stems from the belief that everybody has the right to in-person uh, to be in person, to hear what's been held against them and to be able to respond. And it's a really fundamental principle um, mm. to be able to, 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 be, to be heard and to be in person. So please, can nobody Google that? <laughs> can nobody comment <laughs> if it's slightly um, erroneous? But that fundamental principle, as, we, as, as we're understanding it today, um, that goes to the heart of all this digital stuff particularly live digital stuff, I mean, is what you're trying to do in a room doable? I think to, to, to an adequate level of quality. Now, I'm not just talking about legal stuff, but everything. I think and, I, but, but in terms of legal stuff, then it, it's where you really have to kind of get it right. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're absolutely correct, um, Swain. I think with, with everything, it's about the integrity of the technology and you have to have faith that it will be there and you have to have you know, plan B. So in the court setting, it could absolutely work, but we, you know, that there needs to be um, full confidence that, that the hissing and the, the kind of um, 
internet sort of going down, you know, that, you know, whether you can't appear and there's lots of different ways it could be transacted, I think, to counteract some of the issues that they've had. Mm. One of the big yeah. things I always ask people when people start to think about trying to make, well, before COVID, if you want to live stream an event or make remote attendance at an event possible, one of the things I always ask people to think about is what what impact on the event will the act of live streaming have? Will you suddenly all stop talking among yourselves and doing what you like to do in a room because you're all scared about what's going out on the on the on the channel or can we make it so that the impact on the event is minimal well it doesn't look i mean and it's probably unfair to judge some of it in during covid times but it doesn't look as if that sort of thing's been taken particularly far enough in the legal sphere if, if some of this stuff is as, as reported is, is correct sorry anyway it's it's interesting i find interesting the fact that it's the you know, kind of under twenty five thousand uh, pounds worth cases that are the ones who are going to be who are more to be more to be held online, and not the big commercial companies who you know might might have a lot more I mean, riding on. They can afford to pay for. Yeah, presumably the, the the cases that are coming to court are the ones that aren't soluble simply by definition, almost because if you, you think you'd think yeah. that most cases that were simple would just be agreed or arbitrated or something. Uh, yeah. Surely the ones that are coming to court are the ones where there's some complexity or some absolute disagreement and oh weird mm. anyway okay we're moving on to our next story which is uh, partnering to bring bring, in, bring an end to data poverty and this is um you know we we all know that 61% of people agree that internet access by fixed line or mobile should be recognized as an essential utility like electricity and apparently 47% would donate unused data in low, uh, to low income families in the UK and this was an Ipsos Mori research poll for Good Things Foundation in 2020. Um, so we're glad to see that the Data Poverty Lab is being convened by a partnership between Good Things Foundation and Nominet, which is the official registry for UK names, and it will link with and build upon research ideas and initiatives already in this space and involve people with lived experience of poverty in developing effective, sustainable and innovative solutions. Um, and they're defining data poverty as the inability to afford a sufficient private and secure internet connection to meet essential needs. And the story goes on to say, in the UK, which has the fifth largest economy in the world, data poverty is leaving communities behind and seriously threatens to thwart government ambitions to level up. So we welcome the um, establishment of a data poverty lab. And uh, I think it's going to be very useful to, to lots of people. We um, Next week, in fact, sees the start of the first, well, the second in its iteration, but it's a, a d- data for good festival um, being organised by a number of partners, including Good Thing, um, Data Kind UK and my own business uh, or our organisation is one of the partners as well. So um, I think that that lab would will be of interest to, to people coming along to that event. Yeah. Okay, um, and we move on to our next story. We probably have a chance for one or two more before we have to close today. Um, the next story is about a five-minute guide to podcasts for nonprofits. We all know that podcasts have become even more popular um, since lockdown because people like them uh, to listen to them when they're walking or in the car if they are going on any journeys. But generally, you know, li- listening to something that's not themselves or, or uh, the usual things they listen to. And this is from digitalcharitylab.org, um, and they've given a, a framework. For any new content project, not just podcasts, and they give a list of uh, ideas to work through in this order. And perhaps Wayne, we can learn from this as we as we improve our. We should, um... have, read this. We should have read this before we started. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're we're happy to share it with other, others who are also uh, working on projects like this. So there's there's four points there uh, for, in their framework, and the first is goal. Which of our strategic goals, as defined in our organization strategy, will this help us achieve? Number two, audience. Who are the audiences that will help us to achieve this goal? Number three, channel. What channels do these audiences use? And this must be evidence-based. And number four, content. What kind of content should we produce to engage this audience? Do we have evidence they have an appetite for this topic and they prefer this particular content format over another? Well, we kind of we were invited to um, co-present with someone, uh, John Popham, who we've mentioned, who um, we we felt we had confidence that he had done his uh, enough research hands-on research to Absolutely. know this, this was going to work so uh, we're very happy to continue his great uh, establishment of this of this uh, program it's interesting that none of those um none of those items there is really technical no it's no what, what organizational yeah yeah 
Okay, and we'll cover one more story before we close today. And this is uh, from uh, European Union Dignity Project. And the, the title was, Are Older People Being Excluded from Using Digitalized Transport Options? And we have covered stories, similar stories where people might, because they might not have a smartphone, might not, for example, might not be able to um, be offered the same service. And this story says that older people who are at particular risk of digital exclusion might find using technological solutions for transport problematic. And previous surveys show that digital technology use and digital competence are both lower among older age groups. So while some older people are expert technology users, many struggle. And this is partly a result of changes in physical, sensory and cognitive capabilities, as well as prior experience with understanding of attitudes towards technology. Um, it does say that a large portion proportion of older people have lower levels of confidence in their ability to use technology, are not convinced of its usefulness or have trust and privacy concerns. So it recommends that specific care should be given to the design of digital transport services to be inclusive of older people. Uh, this includes in user involvement during the design process, as, and that's vital, as this helps to ensure user needs and concerns are understood and addressed. Interfaces should be clear, simple and accessible, avoiding the use of jargon, unexplained icons and hidden features. And uh, a final word on this, it is also important to provide non-digital alternatives that do not rely on users having access to a smartphone, a computer or the Internet. And I think we can't say that often enough. Um, you know, we, we, we were recognizing the importance on an ongoing basis of de developing non-digital alternatives. And my mother, again, who I talk about often on the show, um, you know, is constantly showing me things that she finds difficult to navigate. And she feels less intelligent or, you know, that, that it's her fault. And I keep saying to her, it's bad design. It's poor design if something that you should be able to navigate and use isn't uh, navigable or usable for you so that's my yeah, story yeah. and I'm sticking yeah, to yeah, it <laughs> I completely agree with you on that it's poor design yeah Absolutely. yeah okie doke well we've come to the end of our another great show thanks very much Ro for joining us today we're Thank really you. delighted you're able to Absolutely. join us if people want to find Thank you me. online as they often do um, with our guests where is the best place to find you um, I would say um the company Learn Play on, on, on our website, learnplay.com. Uh, and me personally, I'd say LinkedIn is always a good first start. So I'm just Rohans at, at, on LinkedIn. Great. Well, thanks again for joining us. Um, we hope okay. you have a great rest of the week and uh, we hope everybody has a great week. So have a great week, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.